Well, good evening, Rotaractors and Rotarian Honorary. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Anybody know, have ever heard about me before this evening? Y'all follow me on social media? You do? Well, then you have to say, you have to give me a proper introduction then. You can't sit on there and not say, let's get this money. Let, all right, one, two, three. I have to do the, the hand signal too. One, two, three. Let's, let's get, get this money. <laughs> How many of you are students? Any students? The rest of you, are you um, you're working or looking for work? Or what's, what's, this, what's the situation right now? Most of you are working. All right, and you're fairly young, so you're in your first or maybe second job, right? How's it going? <laughs> I hear a chuckle, huh? Yes, trust me, I know how it is, been there, done that, right? So when I was in high school, I had this dream of becoming a journalist. Originally, I wanted to be the great Caribbean novelist. I wanted to be the next V.S. Nepal, uh, the next Holly Ed um, Z. Edgel Bekalam or Sam Selvon, and just write beautiful stories for people to enjoy. And then somewhere along that line, somebody told me, Who's gonna pay you to do that? <laughs> You're not ever gonna make any money doing that. But I also, because my father was and still is a, not a political activist, a union activist, a trade union activist, I also grew up having a sincere interest in current affairs and human rights and social justice. And so I said, well, how can I merge this love of writing with social justice? What can I do that can make a difference in the world? Because I, was, I grew up thinking, you know, money's the root of all evil, and you shouldn't just work for money and do something that you love and you'll never work a day in your life and all that good stuff, right? Sound familiar to anybody? So I came up with journalism. I get to get paid to write, which I love doing, and also pursue uh, the human interest side, human justice, social justice. And I quite enjoyed that job. I still do, I'm still a journalist to this day, just a different type of journalist. So some of you, maybe you're too young, or maybe you were younger when you saw, anybody remember Tivoli Incursion? I reported on that. I was down there dodging bullets <laughs> at Tivoli Gardens on Spanish Town Road. Anybody remember the, uh, the Doppy story in Spanish Town? But the guy, the little boy who was on the chair and the Doppy pulled his leg? Yeah. That was my story. <laughs> so I've done all kinds of stories throughout my career. I've interviewed prime ministers and presidents and reported on elections, uh, hurricanes, numerous. Um, don't think I've ever reported on an earthquake, but I would have if I was still doing that kind of reporting. And I really, really enjoyed my career. Before I went out on my own, I was on Nationwide News Network, Cliff Hughes. I was host of Nationwide this morning for six years. Really, really enjoyed my job. Got awards for it from the Press Association of Jamaica and was on TV and on radio. Glamorous job, right? Right? <laughs> But would you believe that when I was on TV, I still had to take the bus home? I still had to walk on the road at 9 o'clock at night after the news is finished and catch JUTC bus and go home with my full face of glamorous makeup. And people would stop on the road and beg me, miss, begging some money for um, bus fare. And I'm like, you not see me taking bus to <laughs> like, Me and you are in the same position right now. So I was a professional success, but a financial failure. And it is a big, big challenge in Jamaica and many other places as well. People are, you know, you're doing fairly well, but you're underpaid. You're underappreciated. Anybody can relate to that right now, is that some me? Yeah, it is a huge challenge even as you get older. So you do make some improvements, you get promotions, but you know, the struggle is real. You have bills to pay. The more you move up in life, the more expenses you also have because then you wanna buy a car, tired of catch bus, you tired of walk in Sun Hut, and then you wanna buy a house and you have to save up for that deposit and then you go have children and I had children early. I had my first child when I was 19. I was a single mom for several years till I met my now husband, the best husband in the world, by the way. <laughs> and kids are expensive. Anybody here have kids? 
the expensive though, expensive. At one time, my daughter, who's now 20, I remember when she was in prep school and you know, school starts September. And she came home one day, October morning, with her shoes bust up. I'm like, one month into the school year, school, how? how? Were you kicking rocks at school? Like, what happened? And now I have to go find money to buy brand new school shoes one month into the school year. So it is rough out there, unless you are prepared. And the thing about me is, because I grew up hearing all these things, I grew up hearing uh, to be successful in life, study a book. That was my dad's mantra. Study a book, study hard. And then, so study a book, do well in school. Once you do well in school and get good grades, get a good job. Once you get a good job, you work hard in that job. So you keep that job, you get promoted, and then you save your money, right? Sounds familiar? And you will be successful in life. I did that. Anybody, any of you doing that right now? And are, would you consider yourself successful? Not yet. You can't, you're getting there, you're getting there. It's hard to save. When people tell you you must save your money, but then all your expenses are taking you to the brink, to the last dollar, it's like, say what? Where should I get it to save? You're telling me to do this and do that with my money, but the money just isn't enough. And so for the first 35 years of my life, I should say the first 15 years of my adult life from like 20 to 35, I, that's what I knew. And that's what I lived by, trying to make it meet, trying to, you know, make things meet for myself and my child. Around that time I'd already, I just got married as well. And it was what it was until I started moving into the finance, financial journalism world. And I started seeing how these money people moved. I'm like, oh, hold on. If they're making all this money, and I'm here just reporting about them making all this money, why don't I just do what they do and also make some money? Why am I only telling their stories? Why can't I be a part of the story? And around that time is when Jamaica started performing exceptionally well on the global stock exchange. I should say on the global markets. The Jamaica Stock Exchange was the number one performing in the world in 2015 and 2018. And you were getting, people were making money over money over money. One stock, for example, Barita, I think it was 2018, gave average returns of 900 and something percent. I want to, exp nobody gasped. So maybe you don't understand what 900% return mean. That means if you invested $10,000 in January, at the end of the year, that money was almost $100,000 without you having to do anything, nothing at all. That's completely passive income. And on top of that, you also earn dividends. And so I started seeing these stories. I'm reporting on these stories. I'm like, hold on, no, no, I need to start doing this myself. This is, this is not just for the wealthy, because on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, you can get started with as little as 1,000 Jamaican dollars at some brokers, some uh, firms. My rot rotary friend over here at JMMB, what's your minimum? I think it's 10,000. 10,000 Jamaican dollars. You can, uh, but you have to open the account first. So minimum $10,000. And you can then, after that, buy one stock. And most of the stocks on the Jamaica Stock Exchange cost less than 100 Jamaican dollars. So a lot of people have this misconception that investing is for the wealthy, it's for rich people. But I say to you, investing is not only for the wealthy, investing is how you become wealthy. And that is one of the keys to wealth creation. So along this journey, I started feeling like, hold on, no, I'm starting to figure out life because I didn't notice. I thought you just save your money, but it is almost impossible to save your way to wealth, especially when you don't have much savings to begin with, when your expenses are pretty much all your, everything that you earn and then some. So first key, to wealth creation, investing.
Ah, I see some people writing down. Okay, good, 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 take notes. First key to wealth creation is? Investing. Investing. Second key to wealth creation now, entrepreneurship. And guess what? A lot of people, and I was one included up until the age of about 35, 36, I was one of those people who believed that your income is limited to what somebody pays you. When you get your salary, you get your pay, that's what you have to work with. And I never stopped to think outside the box that there are other ways that I could actually earn money. You're not limited to your income. You can start a side hustle. You can start investing and earn dividends. You can do so many different things. You can go on Fiverr now, Upwork, and get um, paid as a freelancer. You can, do, you can start a business. You can invest in a business. You can start a business and get somebody else to run it so that you don't have to do all the physical work um, all the time. But there are so many different ways that you can earn income in addition to your job. So I'm not saying go out and quit your job, because I started my business when I was still working a nine to five, or in my case, five to one, because I was on morning radio, it had to be there at 5 a.m. Shift ended at one o'clock, which gave me all afternoon to work on my side hustle, fortunately. But then I also had a baby, so <laughs> technically it did not give me all afternoon because I have the baby to deal with as well. But when you are motivated, you find a way. When you have goals and aspirations and dreams, you find a way and you deliver that time. So the thing about entrepreneurship is it will take a lot of your time immediately and in the long run, because it may take years before that business starts paying dividends or starts doing well enough to really pay you consistently. So it will take a lot of time, but it is a very, very amazing key to wealth creation if you can own businesses. Just this week, this week? Yeah, this week I was talking to Michael Leachin. Anybody know Michael Leachin? What you know him for? NCB billionaire, US dollars billionaire, not just Jamaican dollars. And he was telling us, because he was on one of my shows called, I'm doing a feature with him called Ask Mike, and he was telling the group that his keys to wealth creation include uh, buying businesses, knowing them extremely well, knowing the industries extremely well, so don't just go buy anything that you don't know nothing about, you have to know them extremely well, or at least come to know them holding them for the long term and using other people's money to invest in these businesses, meaning borrowing. We're gonna come to that as well. Talking about debt. Anybody scared of debt? Anybody have debt, like credit card debt? Yeah, yeah. Or other kind of debt, yeah, it's, it's rough out there. That's another thing. So yes, entrepreneurship is the second key to wealth creation. And then the third key is real estate. So owning property, and when I say real estate, I don't just mean your own home that you live in, but also real estate for an investment purpose. So you can, there's so many ways to make money in real estate. You can flip, anybody heard about flipping houses? So you can buy a rundown property, renovate it, fix it up, and then sell it again for a profit for more than you paid for it. You can do Airbnb, so short-term rentals. You can do long-term rentals and collect the rent every month. You can, do, you can buy and hold and sell years down the road when the value of the property goes up. You can do commercial rentals. You can have a space like this, chop it up into units, and rent space to business people. So there are so many ways to make money through real estate investing as well. And throughout history, real estate has been one of the most profitable and consistent ways of generating wealth. From slavery days, Godong. What you always hear about the wealthy landowners. Landowners were the people back in the day who could vote. You couldn't even vote if it didn't own land. That is because it was a measure of wealth, and it still is today. The challenge with real estate investing is it takes a lot of money up front. So entrepreneurship will take a lot of time. Real estate will take a lot of money. The reason I like stock market investing as a place to begin your journey towards wealth creation is that it doesn't take a lot of time and it doesn't take a lot of money. Like we just discussed, you can start with as little as 10,000 Jamaican dollars, not even that. Some places is even less. Some, at some firms, you can open your account with no money 
and just put money in later on. And like I said, the average price of the stocks, less than 100 Jamaican dollars. So it doesn't take a lot of time necessarily, unless you want to dedicate a lot of time to it, and it doesn't take a lot of money. And then the great thing is you can progress along this chain, which is exactly what I've been doing over the past five years. So I started out as, an, as a stock market investor. As I started making money from that, I used that to invest into my first business, which is what I'm doing today, Kalila Reynolds Media, soon to be known as Money Media. Right, so we have Oreen there who works for us. We have Izzy here who works for us as well. And we have other people back in Kingston. We have equipment as a mech money reinvested into the business, right? So moving from earning funds, earning money from stock market investing, then investing into my own business, and then the most recent chapter now is purchasing our first property, which my husband and I very, very recently did. We bought a house in Ingleside, which is going to rich people here at all. Yes, yes. Living with the doctors and the lawyers and the, who else lived there? Politicians, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and the big wigs, and the Rotarian, oh, the Rotaractors. I mean, the Rotarians, the Rotarians. And, and the president of Rotaract? It's the Ingleside you live, boss? <laughs> yes. Yeah, right, so you move along the chain uh, and you have various elements of wealth creation, but we got to talk about debt. So I mentioned that before, Michael Leach is saying you want to use other people's money, but how many people are scared of debt? And you hear that debt is bad, and you mustn't borrow, you mustn't owe people money, and just all these never ending. And how many people have had bad experiences with debt? I raise my hand because I had bad experiences with debt. For me, it was credit card. Because let me tell you a story. I bought my first car. This was in 2012, bought my first car. And when I bought this car, the loan officer said, let me give you a credit card. Because when you own a car, you always have all kind of random expenses. You're gonna need gas. You're gonna need insurance. I didn't even think about insurance. Insurance, fitness. Um, what's the next one? Insurance, fitness, license, registration. You have all of these additional expenses. I had like exact money to just buy the car. I never have money for the insurance and fitness and registration. So the credit card came in handy and thus began a very, very slippery slope with debt, with credit card debt. Not only that, I got my shiny new credit card and guess what I did? I walked across the street to Style Savvy Boutique. <laughs> And I was like, ooh, this is nice. Give me that, 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 and that, and that. And I went shopping. Swipe it. And then when school fee time came, guess what I did? Swipe it. And normally, before I had the credit card, what I would do is I would save up for the school fee. Because it, it was like $75,000 a term at the time. At prep school in Kingston, King expensive. So I would save up like 25,000 a month and I was put that aside for the school fee. Well, I was like, well, no, I don't have to pay that all at once. Um, swipe it. And very soon my credit card was maxed out. And I had, uh, what the bank says that you just have to pay the minimum payment, right? Just pay the minimum payment. And if your credit card is $100,000, your balance is 100,000, the bank might say, just pay, how much is the intro? Oh, just pay $2,000, three to, just, just give me three thousand dollars, you're a good man. I was like, okay, sure, but what I didn't realize is that the interest rate on that credit card was, anybody can guess what the average credit card interest rate in Jamaica is? Oh, that's not even a guess, you already know. <laughs> it's about 49, 50%. Those interest rates are very, very high. And so when you are paying the minimum balance, and guess what they do? They're, they're very, very sneaky with it, right? So you have your principal repayment on your loan, and you have the interest portion of your loan. They don't separate it. So you don't realize that the majority of your 3,000 minimum payment, if not all, in many cases, 
is only going towards the interest. And you never repay that principal. So you owe 100,000 forever, and it keeps going up because the 3,000 is actually less than the interest that you accrued. So the interest you would have accrued on that 100,000, and I'm just using numbers loosely here, but let's say the interest you would have accrued on the 100,000 was 4,000. But they're telling you, just give me 3,000, which means that you still owe the full 100,000 and you still owe them an extra thousand on interest. So you never pay off that principal balance and your balance actually keeps going up. So even though you paid them $3,000, that doesn't mean that next month you owe them 97,000. Next month you owe them 101,000 because <laughs> you've never paid anything towards your principal and the interest keeps going up. And this happens over and over and over until I finally figured out this don't make no sense and started trying to find a way to do something about it. Now, most recently, I have created a community and you heard it in the bio that I wrote. <laughs> it's called Money Mission. And I realized that we needed a community of like-minded individuals, people who all want to create wealth. And I feel like that's everybody. Everybody wants to create wealth. Everybody wants to learn more about money. But I don't know everything. Even as much as I've learned over the past five years, there's a lot that I don't know. And there's a lot that I don't know that I don't know. And that is the biggest part of ignorance, when you don't even know that you don't know this information. Because for the first 35, of my, for 35 years of my life, I didn't even know that I didn't know. I didn't even know that I needed to go seek this information. All I thought I knew was work hard, get a good job, save money, buy a house. And that never added up in the equation for me until I started studying this stuff. And so I created Money Mission for people to come together and share ideas and resources to create wealth and prosperous businesses. One of our courses is called Debt Do-Over, or Done With Debt, I think it's Done With Debt. And we talk about you know, this whole debt issue, how you can get out of debt, and not only that, but how you can use debt the right way. So I spoke about Michael Lee Chin saying, use other people's money. Because what I came to realize is that debt is not inherently evil. You just have to know how to use debt the right way. I've come to really love credit cards. I hated my credit card at that time. I've come to really love credit cards because it can serve as an interest-free loan for a period of, let's say, three, four weeks until you pay it off at the end of the month. I've come to love using other people's money because it gives you cash flow for other things. So you might pay, end up paying more in the long run, yes, but it frees up your cash now to do things like investing which is what Lee Chin did. Do you know the story of how Michael Lee Chin made his first million dollars? You guys need to watch my interview with him. So he was, I think it's an insurance advisor in Canada. And he actually borrowed 500,000 Canadian dollars to invest in a firm called McKinsey. And four years later, that 500,000 Canadian dollars was worth I think it's like eight million, all because of other people's money. He did not have the money to do that. Now, Mia, you might not be able to go to the bank and borrow 500,000 US dollars or Canadian dollars, him near Lee Chin. He was also making a lot of money at the time from his day job. But you can use the proceeds. I think one of the important lessons from that is that you can use the proceeds of your day job to fund your other wealth creation activities. So you can use your salary to invest in your business and to invest in stock market investing, bonds, and other financial instruments. I have another course called Investing for Beginners, and one coming up on Monday called Money Marketing, which is all about how to make money on social media, which everybody's trying to do right. Not right now, right? Everybody wants to be an influencer, but do you really want to do it just for the clout? Or do you want to do it to make money? I can teach you how to do it to make money. <laughs> so talk to me after this, I'll hook you up, all right? <laughs> but yeah, so let's recap. What are the three keys to wealth creation? Number one, investing. investing. Number two, entrepreneurship. Number three, Real estate, awesome. And is that good or bad? 
depends on how you use it, right? Debt can be a very good financial tool in your wealth creation toolbox, right? So you can use it however you want to use it. So does that help? Yes, no, maybe so. You're not sure? What is, what are you still struggling with right now? I think um, for young people, it's kind of hard battling inflation. Inflation. Cost of living because you made budgets, you like that, okay, this is going to be what you invest or save, and this is your fund money, and this is whatever, but then, like three months down the road, your whole budget is thrown off because when you go to the supermarket, it's like two times the price. Absolutely. So I think like, that's even one thing that's kind of hard. That is a big, big challenge. So you guys know what inflation is? Cost of living gone up, right? Increase in the cost of goods and services. Last year, something cost $100. Patty, perfect example. How much for Patty now? I don't even look, I don't even ask no more. I was getting my card. <laughs> I closed my eye, because $300? Yeah. 300 and something? Oh my goodness, mm -mm. Mm -mm. 330 for one cheese patty, and that's no drinks, no drinks, no, not, no cocoa bread, no nothing, 330, last time I, not even the crumbs, <laughs> the last time I can remember like what patty cost, it was 100 and something, like back when I was budgeting, back when I was budgeting to the penny. It was, I had to have exact money, like for tax fare, for I know I can have one party today, <laughs> you know, and I drinks if I get a fresh box juice, but I could also get a bag juice on the road for like $20, and that will do the trick, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Them kind of way, at the struggle is real. And so one of the things that we talk about inflation, you have to find strategies in today's environment to beat inflation. And that is why saving your money is just not enough. Because $100 last year can't buy the same thing this year. What $100 could buy last year, 10 years ago it could buy a patty. No, it can't. Last year, $200 could buy, a, $250 maybe could buy a patty. And no, it can't. No, it raised to three change, three something. So if you want to beat inflation, you have to use different strategies to make sure that your money grows. So this year right now, inflation is about, I think, 7% six point something percent. Last year it was 10%. So 6% inflation means that if $100, $100 last year, something that cost $100 last year cost $106 this year. That's what 6% inflation means. You need to find strategies to make your money worth more, to make your $100 worth more than $106 this year. And if you're simply saving it, whether under your mattress or at the bank, it is not going to be worth $106 this year. It's actually going to be worth less. If you're saving it at a bank, it's not even going to be worth $100. Because guess what? The bank is going to take out their fees. <laughs> and every time you swipe your card, it's a fee. And every time you go to the ATM, it's a fee. And so the $100 in the bank is not even worth the $100 anymore this year. So you need to find strategies to make your $100 worth more than 106 this year in order to beat inflation. And investing, entrepreneurship, and real estate can help you get there. Start with the baby steps. Start with the cheapest and the easiest, which is stock market investing. It's not doing so great this year, I'm going to admit. You're probably going to lose some money this year, but investing is best for the long term. And guess what? Warren Buffett, who is one of the wealthiest men in the world, billionaire multiple times over, top 10 richest in the world, says, be greedy when others are fearful, and be fearful when others are greedy. I want you to think about what that means. Say it with me. Be greedy when others are fearful, and be fearful when others are greedy. So when everybody's afraid, that's when you should invest. That's when you should make a move. Because guess what? Supply and demand. Simple, simple laws. If everybody wants something, it's going to be expensive. But if nobody wants, it's going to be cheap. So right now, you have a lot of people who are afraid. 
But what does Warren Buffett say to do when people are afraid? That's when you should be greedy. Everybody's afraid, so the prices on the stock market are down here. That's when you should be greedy. Prices are low, buy, buy, buy. But when everybody is, what's the other word? When everybody's greedy, price is expensive. There's a hype. So you're gonna see a hype. I remember this two years ago with cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Bitcoin was at 70 something thousand US dollars for one. And everybody was hype over it. Bitcoin's gonna go to a million. And everybody stopped buying Bitcoin. And so everybody, so, you know, the price started going further up because everybody was being greedy. But when everybody's being greedy, that's when you should be fearful. That's when you should say, I don't want the hype. Give me at a better price. And right now, Bitcoin is at 20 something thousand. <laughs> if you believe that Bitcoin, huh? Is that 34? Oh, perfect. Last I checked, it was at 20 something thousand. So if you invested at 20 something thousand, it's now 34, you make a good profit. But if you invested at 70 odd thousand, you lost all of this money. So when everybody else was fearful because it fell to 20 something thousand within a few months, that's when you'd be greedy and now it's going back up. So these are some strategies to help create wealth creation, to help create wealth. These are some things that I wish I knew when I was your age. Unfortunately, I, it took me until I was 35 years old to start figuring this out and starting out my life. So I recommend that you start on this road towards wealth creation now. Put aside whatever you can to start investing and begin on your journey to wealth. And